Hi everyone, this is James from the Controllers and Podcast by Octopart. Today we have a guest for you, well, two guests from the same company. Uh, we have Christopher and Carol from uh, Mysterine. They are an augmented reality company making some really cool products. Uh, just want to get to know them, see what the company is about. Thanks for coming on the show. Great to talk to you. Thanks. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. Any, anytime. Uh, do you want to just tell us a little bit about the company, uh, sort of what the product is and, and what your mission is? Basically, the company Mysterine is focusing on uh, augmented reality plus virtual reality. Currently, we are working on extension of uh, our platform. And our aim is uh, that the companies can basically utilize this by themselves. Firstly, so we are aiming at industry companies uh, so that they can use it towards their customers, consumers, people, and okay. companies. And uh, the second point is that it's uh, fairly safe, so it's protecting IP sort of thing. Uh, so we are mainly focusing on using uh, uh, using uh, the product on the computer itself, that the companies can decide what to push out, and uh, that uh, it also, in the end uh, application, it also works uh, without without the data connection to the servers, etc. So we can download it to the uh, to the phone or to the tablet or to the glasses and use it uh, offline also. Fascinating. Uh, and for anyone who doesn't understand the differences, what is the main difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Virtual reality is uh, basically a completely different environment. Uh, so if you want to play a game, a uh, sci-fi game in complete... Uh, Immersion. Immersion. Uh, that you are basically in a complete, uh, complete different world. Um, augmented reality or extended reality is that you are in your own environment in the real world and uh, the computer through some screen is adding additional objects into it so uh, it can be used to basically walk around some machine uh, to show some training concepts etc uh, where you actually need to interact with the environment or where you need to interact with other people which is a bit harder in virtual reality. So augmented reality obviously seems like something that could be applicable to a lot of different areas of business. Uh, what are some of the main ones that you're using it for? Well, as it's visual, you can use it for anything, uh, but mainly uh, its biggest use is in showing uh, complex things. So when you need to convey complex things to someone else, some other person, so it's either uh, manual where you need to show, okay, how to repair some stuff or a training, uh, how to operate some machine, which is not there in some specific environment, for example, also, uh, or when you want to show some specific customized uh, product to a customer, that customer comes and he says, I want this kitchen, this kind of kitchen with this kind of equipment, and you can suddenly show it to the customer. Oh, that's great. Uh, so you can sort of use it as a, a broader, like more um, holistic approach or a more specialized approach, but if you need it to be. Yes, but uh, as I said, you know, you need to, con you, you, know, you are using it whenever you need to convey messages visually, but of course, uh, you know, if you want to convey simple message, it's easier to talk than to program mm -hmm. some stuff. Uh, <laughs> <but> <laughs> Of course, you can do so, uh, but most of the time it's uh, really about uh, a lot of paper, uh, large written manuals uh, mm. where you can suddenly make things easier and also make people understand easier because when they suddenly can see how the things are being done, how they are supposed to be done, uh, or uh, how the kitchen which you want will look in your house, that's something which people can uh, really benefit from. Yeah, no, I definitely see that as, as, as a huge plus. Um, and this technology has been around for a, a little while now. I've seen it progressing over time. Obviously, the one that people would know is Pokemon Go, which everyone talks about. Um, what do you sort of see as like uh, the future trajectory of this technology? How far can you think it can go? I think the main point is to get the hardware ready and operational because currently uh, the glasses are 
perfect, nice for VR or AR, whatever you want, but it's still about, I don't know, 20 million pieces there, while phones, uh, it's over 2 billion, 3 billion pieces of phones and uh, tablets and these things. So the distance in the hardware possibilities is fairly big and this basically needs to, uh, this needs to get tackled. And of course, it's a question uh, also, you need some content because without content, you don't usually move the hardware forward that much. So it's chicken or an egg. But we are waiting basically mainly for the glasses. That is the main trend which where the whole industry will go. So uh, when you say waiting for the glasses, you want those to become sort of a more commonly held item? Uh, yes, exactly. More accessible. Well, more commonly, uh, more common item, but also like the technology needs to also progress uh, because it's about batteries, about computing power in the glasses, etc. Mm -hmm. About making it easy for the people to use. Uh, so that is the main point. It is exactly the same as uh, phones. Right. Well, that makes total sense. Um, you have some some products that I want to ask about. There was Studio Server and the app. Um, what are each of these and how do they sort of interact with each other? Yeah, so in our uh, platform, basically app is the end product, what the end user sees, right? It's what gives basically the augmentation in the world. And right now this is then done on iOS and Android. So you take out your phone, you're looking at whatever it is you're going to look at, and you're seeing it augmented into the, rea the real environment. And what that could be changes a lot depending on the, the case. Um, but how that gets there is then through the other two parts. So in the studio is where we have a no-code solution where it's intended to be in the our clients, so the business clients, premises where they can actually go do this all this stuff themselves. Traditionally in AR, you hired a company and gave them a lot of money and they built something for you in six months or whatever. And, and this is actually, you just take your data, it's on your premises where you want it, and you can then create something that will be published out either privately or publicly. So there's this level of security that can be put in there. And through our servers, but they can also be named servers for each company kind of thing, uh, it pushes out to these to the app. And therefore can be out there. And then the app displays it. It can be fairly precise on how it is or fairly fluid uh, with the kind of stuff that you see in Go. Um, and uh, the rendering, et cetera, is pretty good on modern phones. So you can have something that's pretty impressive right there. So it's, it's a product pipeline that's there, but the intention is to get it in the hands of the companies there more than that and let them be able to do it, make it accessible, basically. Yeah, the point was basically to make the technology available to other companies without, ex that they don't have to use experts with some specific expertise. That's first thing which we were aiming at. And the second one is that they are able to push out the content in a matter of hours. Altium 365 lets you hold the fastest design reviews ever. Share your designs from anywhere and with anyone with a single click. It's easy. Leave a comment tagging your teammate and they'll instantly receive an email with a link to the design. Anyone you invite can open the design using a web browser. Using the browser interface, you're able to comment, mark up, cross probe, inspect, and more. Comments are attached directly to the project, making them viewable within Altium Designer, as well as through the browser interface. Give it a try and get started with Altium 365 today. So it sort of seems like a, almost a, like democratization process of, of uh, augmented reality, um, making it accessible to everyone as opposed to just the heavy hitters with the big, big wallets to spend. Yes, basically, yes. It's also focusing on companies. So also the, the license uh, terms are basically adjusted to this uh, so that uh, Basically, there's no limitation on the end users, uh, et cetera, so that you don't have uh, issues if 
somebody's downloading it or not, etc. So. Interesting. Um, I wanted to ask as well that you uh, had collaborated with ESA uh, for some yeah. special projects. Yeah. yeah, so with the European Space Agency, we've had two projects. Uh, the first one was Viper, which actually Viper kind of laid the foundation for our current product, the, the AR stuff. Uh, there, ESA is interested in uh, this kind of thing where they can augment onto physical things. So th their use cases and, uh, and a partner that was an industrial partner was very much about putting it on to. So you have a physical object and the person doing maintenance in this scenarios actually sees what they're supposed to do on the object itself. So this one doesn't make sense, but if I was going to fix the mouse, it would show me exactly where I need to pry to open up the mouse to be able okay. to get inside kind of thing. And every step will be highlighted exactly. And it's just then the system to be able to do it where that data needs to be protected because it's not something they can put into a cloud platform or something like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, very proprietary. So that CAD data, that's the input for that kind of system in this case, then can't be given to anybody else. Varias, the second project, which is uh, still ongoing, is to take the same kind of principles of what we've done with them in the past in Viper, but to add it to VR training. So okay. instead of augmenting on a physical object, basically we have a system that allows you to augment onto the virtual object in VR to train how to do it. And the same kind of augmentations to say, okay, this is the way to do it. But we've gone beyond that and also have a system that allows you to, to define how that manual for training looks by actually performing the actions in VR. So it basically means that, uh, and that's what's interesting, that uh, you don't have a person clicking on a computer doing the lecture or something uh, for Astra or somebody else. But you basically tell to the expert who designed the uh, the machine or the object, and you will put them into the virtual environment, and the expert will say, "Well, it's supposed to be done like this," and he's basically doing it in the virtual environment. And the computer records all these activities, and then somebody just do some post production, so says, "Okay, this is one step, or this is second step. Uh, I need to add a mark here, a question mark, or." some uh, explanation mark or put there you need to tighten the screws for this force etc so you basically add there some additional stuff and then you can push it into the uh, push it into the lecture immediately so it makes it fairly easier for to make again the lectures and it also makes it easier to observe what is being done because uh, for the astronauts it's critical they also you know figure out if it was designed correctly so maybe somebody will do it somehow in a different way, but they also need to optimize uh, uh, because they are there for a certain amount of time. They need to do a lot of things. So they are also optimizing it from the perspective of time. Interesting. Uh, that's what has me wondering. Have, have you done any studies uh, sort of on uh, effectiveness of, of this form of training versus uh, like reading a manual? Is, is it more effective this way when you actually see it? We have not, but there has been studies in the past. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this has been looked at in, in classic VR and even a little bit of AR um, literature back many years already. Um, and basically anything that's procedural, so that you're going through a procedure, it's highly effective. It's as effective as real training on real devices and, and definitely more than just anything that's abstract where you just have, you know, read a manual and you have no context, right? Um, sure. And then as, as something Carl kind of mentioned earlier with the AR case, uh, one of the powers is you don't have to have that physical object there, right? It's, it's VR, it's just there. We can do the same kind of thing with the AR platform we already have, where you can visualize something in front of you in AR and even as a group, right? So we can have it, I don't know, whatever our new product is that we're pitching to our big boss in the company, we can actually have it kind of visibly in the middle of the, the scene, or the room in the meeting on the meeting table, and actually everybody be looking at it and seeing it from different perspectives and be able to converse as if it was actually there. 
That's and great. VR is just more powerful. Great. No, I mean, I, I can definitely see why the, the benefits of this versus the more traditional way of doing things. I think the main point Chris is saying actually it is very much powerful, especially if you look at it from the perspective that you can do it today with your phone. Yes. That, that is yeah. the point of view, you know, so the company don't have to suddenly spend large amounts of money for specific equipment, uh, take care of it, hire specific people. You can do it with your phone. So that's right. the point. Yeah, I imagine like say say it's uh, you have something like this for how to repair a car engine if a car breaks down and you break down on the side of the road. You don't have a manual with you or anything like that, but you can pull up the guide and see exactly how to do it. I'm sure that's incredibly useful. Exactly. I want to ask as well, sort of what what role do you see AR tech playing in the future of business overall? Is this something you see becoming more normalized? I definitely think so, uh, especially you can see also movement from the large technological companies investing into, uh, into this. Uh, from the perspective of the business, like there's consumer and business perspective. Uh, consumer, of course, we want fantasy worlds and nice stuff, etc. Uh, but business, uh, the key point is actually real environment and safety. Uh, this is really critical for the business that the people understand uh, what to do, how to do, and they are basically in a safe environment and they understand the logic and steps behind. And ideally that it's a group which is being trained together where can be there also some interaction. So definitely the business scenario will be pretty interesting for the AR, especially when the new hardware is readily more available, which is Mm. I think we are currently seeing that it's it's getting there now. I want to ask as well, uh, do you have any future development plans in place? I know you mentioned when we were talking by email uh, that there was going to be a VR version of the uh, Mystery Studio. Yeah, so that's kind of will be built upon what we've done for the, the ESA project uh, for Varius. So it's it's kind of built on top of our existing studio that allows you to build the AR manuals or the AR content, but it allows you to add um, the interactivity the more uh, that the object actually behaves in a way like that the real object does, which is extending it in, into a kind of a digital twin kind of space. Um, and then, of course, the, the VR side that you can actually view it and, and be able to interact with it and train with those things. So, yeah, uh, the VR extension to this is one of the things we're working on. Basically, it means that we want to uh, allow the experts to go into the virtual environment, do the expert procedure with actually interacting with the objects that is recorded. Somebody does a post-production. And then it's either used for virtual trainings when it's something specific, or it can be pushed into the uh, into the augmented reality manuals. So it will be pushed onto the phone, and that's how it's going to look like. So the expert can spend less time. He's interacting with the physical objects, not the computer. So it's kind of easier uh, to uh, do the stuff and maintain the stuff uh, for the company. And this is sort of a, a more general question, but uh, what are some of the key trends that you've been seeing in the tech sector in the last few years? Well, uh, definitely, again, it's, it's about the glasses. Everything is about the glasses. Uh, all the companies are asking about it. They want to try it. Uh, then currently, they are basically, for some rollouts, they are focusing on uh, phones and tablets because it's readily more available and it's... Uh, already established hardware, uh, but uh, AR definitely is designed for glasses. So definitely glasses is the key, hardware is the key. Uh, then, uh, of course, it's uh, also about what kind of uh, processes and uh, where where it's used. So currently it's used for some, a lot of times for some showcases, demonstrations, uh, but I uh, basically see the movement to the usual scenarios uh, for trainings, uh, training on the job trainings, uh, showcases to the customers that they can really check by themselves uh, some stuff, uh, do it by themselves also potentially. Uh, so all these things that uh, basically the information is readily more available uh, to the end user.
So this is a question we like to ask everyone that comes on the show. Uh, if you knew now, if you knew what you know now before COVID about what was going to happen and how business was going to change in those last few years, what would you have done differently? Probably not much because we were betting on this before COVID. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, maybe the VR would have been, Yeah. if things had been in place in VR prior to that, in a lot of companies, it would have been a very good boon, right? Because you remove the actual physical of other people, right? You can have people very isolated. Uh, unfortunately, you know, companies have been reluctant to adopt VR uh, in the past. Um, that's changing dramatically. Um, AR with the phones, though, uh, and actually the technology that's advanced since then uh, makes that possible. With ARs with the phones, everybody can use now. Yeah. I think also there's been a big shift in, in culture in, in a lot of businesses uh, since COVID to be more willing to try new things and open to new technologies. Um, I mean, the work, the working remote model alone has been such a game changer for so many companies. I think that they tried something that revolutionary and it's all, okay, this kind of works. Maybe we can try some other stuff. So I, I can definitely see them being more accepting of new technologies like this. For sure. Great. Uh, well, I think that's, that's everything we wanted to ask, but I have one more question. Just, uh, if people want to support the company, keep up to date with, uh, your technology and what you're rolling out or follow you on socials or any of that sort of thing, what are the best places to do that? Well, everything is actually on our web page. And if people really want to support us, they can also download our studio free of charge and test it and do some cool stuff and show it on their social media and uh, share some content with their friends. That would be the coolest thing. That's why we did it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was really fascinating learning about this. Uh, I think it's an area a lot of people are going to find very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Anytime. And for anyone listening at home, come back next week and we will have another guest for you. Mm -hmm.